followed only by Chaim Seiman himself, who will have 10 minutes to answer point by point every criticism leveled against him today. So we'll, uh, we'll go straight into his when we're done with this panel. I too want to, I'm Dave Caudill, I'm on the faculty here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chaim for including me in this and including me in the planning and a couple of years ago getting a copy of the book to read while he was writing it and, uh, and it was really great and now to see it come to this and to have this conference is just, it's just fabulous and it's great to be here. Uh, I've seen some people here that I've met at conferences before. Uh, my, my colleague, Kevin Hughes, over at Bill and Nova Theology, I did not recognize him. Uh, I've, I've met before Nathan Oman a year ago in California. I didn't recognize him. So <laughs> if I ever meet you at a conference, I won't recognize you when I see you again. But it's good to see those people again. Um, the panelists, I won't go into a lot of detail because we want to keep this thing going. But first of all, uh, Vince Lloyd, my colleague in theology here, uh, I, I was... In, involved in the process of hiring him, the theology department very much wanted to get him here. And one of the things he did is he came by to see me and the law school and said, well, one of the things I want to do if I come to Villanova is have a lot of interaction with law. He's very interested in political theology. So this is your gift. You've got to come over and be involved in the law school. So anyway, uh, he's going to be speaking on the charisma of literary texts and even perhaps the charisma of law professors like Kime. So I like that topic. Also, we have Tal Kessner uh, from NYU here. Uh, her areas of research, I met her last year when she was here for an insurance law conference, but now here for law and literature, uh, this panel on law and literature, which is also one of her specialties. Uh, and coming out with a book soon on law and language, on boilerplate, on contract language, and the way that language in law creates things like freedom. Uh, very much a law and literature methodology topic even though it doesn't involve a piece of standard literature. So that's something that law, uh, law and literature is involved with. And then we're really privileged, and I'm not sure why this panel is the inside out, the most furthest out one. Uh, in a way, we've talked about inside Jewish law and then went to law and religion and law and theology and then legal theory. Why law and literature is the furthest out, I don't know. Maybe because it's literary, uh, but... <laughs> In, in Heim's case, it's very much involved with what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was the reason. Okay. Well, anyway, the last two speakers that we have seriously are leaders in the law and literature movement, really founding people in the law and literature movement. I met Sandy Levinson uh, 30 years ago when I was a real estate attorney in Austin, Texas, and he took it on to turn this real estate attorney, Texas real estate attorney, into a law professor, into a legal theorist. And he helped me so much professionally. And he, he did such a good job that the delusion has continued to the point where I hold a chair here. So he, whatever, whatever he did was right, you know, to, to get me going in that direction. And Sandy's going to talk about religion in law and literature, including Judaism, but also Catholicism. And then finally, Richard Weisberg, a friend of mine for 25 years, who's not only helped me professionally in my life, but also personally, he and his wife, Cheryl, who's here. And uh, I have a very deep in relationship with him, but also a huge admiration for what he's accomplished in the world of law and literature. Uh, he's going to take up the question of binaries, things like law and literature or form and substance that seem to be unities or binaries, and we'll deal with that question. So let's start with Sandy. Thank you. Uh, I, too, want to convey my very deep appreciation. This is an absolutely wonderful book, and I'm already looking forward to an occasion in um, May in Washington where Chris, Christine Hayes and I and others um, who had been part of the Hartman Institute will meet for a discussion of Heim's book. Uh, I also want to just disaffirm being a founding father of law and literature, Richard really is. Um, I, I don't think that that's really fair in my case, but it's certainly uh, true that I'm interested in certain analogies between law and literature. Um, my title of this talk originally was Reading Halakha, referring to the book, not the, the you know, overall uh, literature of Halakha as a secularist. Uh, during the course of the morning, I changed the, the title a bit slightly. Reading Halakha is a disenchanted 
secularist with a tip of the hat to Max Weber and his definition of modernity uh, as disenchantment um, in the world where enchantment, I think for Weber, by and large, meant religious beliefs and religious identity. Um, and so I'm very sp explicitly speaking from that perspective. <clears throat> The demand that I make of my reader, James Joyce once apparently told Max Eastman, is that he should devote his whole life to reading my works. <laughs> Eastman wrote that Joyce, quote, smiled as he said that, smiled and then repeated it. Uh, so one might well believe that the author of Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake believed it, not least because Joyce, as an essential modernist author, um, is quite obviously in his own work substituting literature, literary creation for religious belief. Um, uh, Port of the Artist of the Young Man is infinitely easier to read um, than either Ulysses, which I have read, or Finnegan's Wake, which I have not. Um, and certainly one of the central messages of Portrait of the Artist is leaving behind what Joyce finds as a, an almost completely disreputable Roman Catholicism for a very different identity and very different, if you will, secular religion as the forger of the consciousness of his race or of his people, but it's, it's not one that has a formal religious overtone to it. Um, I think one often finds this in people who describe themselves as Joycians or Jainites or lovers of the immortal bard where they look to certain central literary figures, uh, perhaps poets, uh, for what had previously been sought in more overtly religious texts. Um, Richard, who's an old friend and at times a uh, friendly adversary, um, has written notable exegeses of Billy Budd and the Merchant of Venice, challenging what had largely been conventional wisdom, and one explanation for his zeal, and I use the word zeal uh, as a compliment rather than a criticism, is that he believes that these texts and their authors have served to shape our culture and concomitantly that it is crucial perhaps for the sake of our souls to get them right. Um, it may not be a coincidence that one of the major uh, books about Melville is Melville's quarrel with God. Um, and certainly one can't read um, uh, Moby Dick or, or Billy Budd outside of, of that particular um, quarrel. Um, so this brings me to Chaim Samon's truly remarkable book, Halakha, the Rabbinic Study of Law. Uh, in what spirit exactly does one or should one read it? And does the answer depend um, um, on what imp does the answer depend and the impact the book might have on our lives depend on um, our own identity. Any reader from any background will find a treasure trove of illuminating discussions on almost literally every page. Um, and um, you know, I think that that shouldn't go without saying, but it is worth saying, but simply because it's true. But that only raises the question of why one might be interested in that topic. As a lawyer and increasingly student of comparative law, I can easily believe that the rabbinic study of law is at least as valuable a focus of study as, say, the German or Singaporean idea of law both of which present their own challenges to parochial Americans who know, alas, from my perspective, primarily about the United States Constitution, uh, which I regard as a flawed constitution that has generated a dangerously flawed system of law. As Kipling once wrote, what should they know of England who only England know? Paradoxically or not, the suggestion is that one in fact learns far more about one's own home and its traditions from encountering so-called alien ideas, um, it is not that going to Paris will lead one to renounce Britain, though of course that might occur. Rather, it is going to Paris or far more exotic uh, places will lead one to understand uh, what one regards as being British. It perhaps will lead to supporting Brexit. Who knows? Um, but 
uh, it has consequences uh, as to how one identifies oneself and the society one identifies with. So one response to the book is to praise it to the skies, as I've happily done, suggest that everybody read it, which I happily do, regardless of his or her relationship to Judaism. Indeed, just as the old ad reminded its readers that one need not be Jewish to enjoy Levy's rye bread, so it is the case that non-Jewish readers can profit immensely from reading halakha. Seyman uh, writes with almost astonishing clarity, and I literally cannot think of a better introduction to what often appears to be the truly forbidding reality of Talmud. But that is not the same thing as necessarily being able to predict the actual lessons that will be learned. Return to Joyce for a moment. One can read him, at least in part, um, as an entry point into learning about a strange and to most of us alien society of Irish Catholics. Um, um, and you know, many other lessons could be drawn from reading that or any other of Joyce's books or any other um, uh, author one uh, wishes to say. There is not one, I would say, either one right way to read a s significant literary text, nor even more importantly, will the response of the reader be universal. Um, I am a fan of Stanley Fish and of reader response theory, and it does seem to me that reader response theory um, at its heart um, is um, simply a recognition of the old adage that what you see depends on where you sit, um, and that uh, different readers will have decidedly different responses. Um, and so I'm going to sketch out um, some of my own um, responses um, to this uh, remarkable book. With religious texts especially, there's a fundamental difference, I think, between those who might be called insiders and outsiders to the traditions for whom the texts are fundamental. Um, and I think it's important, especially for purposes of, of my remarks right now, that the inside-outside distinction not be limited to those of us who identify as Jewish, or even those of us who have, with some interest, read Talmudic texts now for about 30 years, uh, thanks to the Hartman Institute. I had literally never picked up a page of Talmud uh, before going to Jerusalem in, or actually is going to Canada in 1983. Uh, largely to get away from Austin heat and you know, going to the Laurentians, why not, uh, to spend a week with friends of mine where the price was discussing Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed and reading some edges of, of Talmud. And it did change my life in a number of ways, but let me say right now, uh, the 30-year uh, affiliation with the Hartman Institute has not in one whit made me more religious in any standard sense. It simply introduced me to a body of very interesting materials, um, some of which were of interest to me because I you know, am a lawyer of sorts and am very interested in hermeneutics. And you, know, you can hardly do better than read Talmud if you're interested in hermeneutics and often remarkable interpretive moves that apparently seemingly come out of nowhere and then you try to make sense of them uh, by reading even more. Um, um, Adam Gopnik recently had a very interesting essay in The New Yorker, uh, largely about reading the Koran, where he emphasized the difference in response as to whether you're reading the Koran, for example, because very, very clearly, all of us should know more about the Koran than we are likely to know for political and sociological reasons. It may or may not be a great literary work, but that's almost beside the point. It is essential to understanding a great deal of the world we live in today, uh, just as one really ought to read um, uh, both uh, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, independently of whatever one happens to think of uh, the merits of um, either of them, either as literary texts or uh, of whatever morality they might be thought 
uh, to uh, instantiate. But one of the points Skopnik made is that if you're reading as an outsider, you're not really going to have any existential crises if you come to the conclusion that this is really a dreadful sort of suggestion, the duty to kill the Amalekites. Um, I mean, forget about the rebellious son, because that has been neutralized. No rebellious children um, have been killed, at least in accordance with Jewish law, um, maybe forever. Um, but one of the reasons Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated was the argument that he was not paying sufficient attention to the duty to slay the Amalekites who arise in every generation. Uh, so this particular patch of text um, is not without contemporary import. Uh, we, you know, we could talk about other things, the plight of the Aguna um, and, and the like. And if you're an outsider, you simply find, say, you find that interesting. Uh, some of it you might find very inspiring, some you might find repugnant, but at some level it just doesn't mean that much to you, except in the crassest political sense. These are consequences for you know, world peace, perhaps, or for the future of a region you might have political interest in, but it doesn't cause you really to question who you are, your continued affiliation uh, with a religion that would subscribe to these views. Um, um, and um, the like. So the central question I want to explore is what difference it might make if one explores uh, Seyman's book from a basically secular, disenchanted perspective rather than as adherent of what might be termed, however problematically, religious Judaism. One possible peculiarity of Judaism one, is this Judaic exceptionalism, especially in the United States, is that everybody has heard and can identify the definition of the term secular Jew. Um, I don't know if any other religions regularly use that notion. My impression is that within Catholicism there are lapsed Catholics of whom Joyce would be a um, primary example, but there are not secular Catholics, I, or at least I just don't see that referred to very often. I have no idea whether one regularly refers to secular Muslims as opposed to lapsed or whatever, infidels, whatever the, the correct term would be, I guess I'd be mildly surprised if you know, the term secular Muslim or secular Mormon or whatever has much currency, whereas it's a primary way of identifying lots of people who are correctly identified, like myself as Jewish, uh, in terms of certain ethnic identity, culinary preferences, uh, fasting on Yom Kippur um, sort of thing. Um, but the, the adjective is really um, foundationally um, Im important. Um, so the question is whether Judaism must necessarily be intertwined in some recognizable way with God, including halacha, especially if halacha is viewed not as a human construct, which is the way I would view it, apropos of the question uh, at the end of the last panel, but rather in some sense linked to, um, to God. Uh, Richard's prepared remarks uh, where he talks about his colleague David Bleich um, says that uh, the Halakhic tradition is, is, quote, endowed with sanctity because it is divinely ordained, unquote. You know, I don't believe that. That's not why I'm interested in halakha, I, and, um, but you know, is that in fact constitutive of being an halakhic uh, Jew? Um, in my prepared remarks, I have fairly extensive discussion of another book uh, that was published, uh, I think now about three years ago, by Roberta Qual, The Myth of the Cultural Jew, quote, uh, colon, Culture and Law in the Jewish Tradition. To offer the quick and oversimple summary of that book, uh, she basically either criticizes or denounces the possibility of being merely a cultural or a secular Jew. 
she finds a constitutive link between taking halakha really seriously, and I think if truth be known, uh, she probably would agree um, with uh, Rabbi Bleich that one takes it seriously because it has a connection um, um, with God or with uh, divinity. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, I wrote a respectful but critical review of uh, her book on balkanization. Um, the chapter I find, found most truly compelling and fascinating and helping to explain why I begin with James Joyce in Heim's book is the chapter on the briskers because more than any other single chapter in the book, it establishes Halachic Man, which I think is the title of Soloveitchik's book, as a totalistic way of being in the world, that every moment really should be spent in halakhic study, presumably with the exception of such time as is taken care for fundamental family responsibilities. But there's no sense of a public self who would be interested, let us say, in the flourishing of the United States or New York State, should you happen to live in um, Williamsburg or uh, Kirat Joel. Uh, you know, they may as well be the moon for all you really care, that what you care is devoting yourself to the totalistic life um, of, of Torah. Um, and, you know, for obvious reasons, I found that extremely interesting. Um, and can you possibly sustain any kind of genuine political world, either in, you know, 68, um, um, you know, right before the destruction of the temple in the medieval period or today as a brisker. And quite frankly, I doubt it. And of course, this is a major, major issue in Israel. The extent to which the majority of Israeli Jews would define themselves, I think it's fair to say, as secular Jews. They define themselves as Jews, no doubt about that. But I think if you ask them, they'd say they're secular Jews. Um, but they are forced by the mechanism of the Israeli state to engage in handsome subsidization of halachic Jews define whether they're briskers or not, they define themselves largely as you describe the briskers. And for raw political reasons, I can say I find this a bug rather than a feature of the Israeli state. Um, I find the use of political power by um, certain Jewish communities, particularly in New York, to be repugnant rather than admirable, but they are very, very much, I think they would view themselves as a lot, and they would have only contempt for people like me. And unlike the Amish, who at least don't vote, they do organize themselves politically, but exclusively for the purpose of getting welfare goods for their very parochial community. Now, from one perspective, and I'll stop with this, um, you know, I, I've taught First Amendment, um, and I, I certainly am familiar with the debates about the meaning of the Free Exercise Clause and the importance of taking religions, and including religions I don't particularly like or, or think in many ways are counter to the public good, that one not sh should not only tolerate them, but accommodate them and the like. Uh, but let me say, I find many of these debates really quite tough when accommodation um, can be genuinely costly to some sense of civic identity and some sense of civic citizenship to go along 
with a far, far more limited notion of religious identity and religious citizenship, even if you assert that this is the most important citizenship at all, because after all, it's citizenship in the divine community, which is the only community that counts. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dave, for the invitation to uh, cross the railroad, the literal, literal railroad tracks uh, out there between the law school and uh, the rest of uh, campus, and to uh, visit uh, you all here. And thanks to Chaim and the uh, Law Review uh, and the staff for putting the uh, event together. Uh, I've had the good pleasure of being able to see uh, over the last couple of years as well this uh, book developed from manuscript to uh, physical object uh, and uh, it is, uh, I, I will join in the recommendation, it is expansive, it is spirited, it is ambitious, but it uh, never lacks grounding, uh, even if Chaim uh, disclaims uh, being a historian, uh, grounding in the uh, historical uh, sensitivities uh, and ultimately uh, compelling. Uh, I should say that I, uh, I come from a Department of Theology and Religious Studies, and today I'm wearing the Religious uh, Studies hat, uh, which has its own sort of disciplinary uh, norms and uh, a culture quite different from the law school world, so you'll uh, excuse me uh, if I violate norms, uh, which uh, I may uh, unintentionally uh, or intentionally uh, do. <laughs> Uh, and I, I also normally work on uh, quite different sorts of issues. Uh, I write on African-American Christianity and politics, and I write on uh, theories of religion and culture. Uh, so how I ended up on a panel on uh, law and literature and uh, Jewish context, uh, <laughs> a bit of a mystery, but I uh, enjoy a challenge, uh, and uh, I think I may have a couple of things to say uh, around the topic that I, I'll try and uh, approach somewhat uh, circuitously. Uh, and my point of entry is one that's uh, already been uh, mentioned uh, a couple of times today. That is this fascinating and provocative and haunting reference to Jesus, <laughs> right? Uh, that that uh, makes uh, its way uh, into and uh, sort of uh, uh, continues throughout uh, in different ways, explicitly or implicitly. Chaim's book, this challenge, uh, which I would read as a challenge of supersessionism, right? the, uh, the, this uh, Christian theological view that the Jew, Jewish people were replaced by uh, the Christians and now uh, Jewish people can be discarded, they're no longer God's chosen people and Christianity um, sort of reigns triumphant. Right? This uh, question of supersessionism is a theological one, uh, one that sort of opposes uh, law, uh, a caricature of law to grace or a caricature of grace. And as I said, I, I'm uh, wearing a religious studies hat today, so I'm interested in how this dynamic of supersessionism circulates in culture right, outside of a specifically Christian theological uh, context. So I'm interested in how in cultural and literary texts, this opposition between law and grace uh, still has a hold in how we imagine uh, things and uh, ought to be challenged. And, and in this way, Chaim's book is doing uh, important work in and challenging that. And uh, there are different ways that one might um, read uh, Halakha as uh, the book as uh, challenging supersessionism. One is fairly straightforward, right? There's a caricature of law uh, that's operative. Uh, and if we offer a richer account of law, then uh, the stark opposition between law and grace, Jew being replaced by Christian, old law, new law. You know, if, if what law means is richer, then that opposition sort of fades away. Its, its force uh, is no longer there. But I, I, I also uh, think from the other direction, uh, may, uh, maybe a slightly more dangerous direction, right, one could look for something grace-like uh, in the law, right? Something uh, not, so rather than expanding this conception of law, saying, well, this other thing, this caricature of grace, maybe there's something like that that we'll find in the law. But again, uh, I'm not wearing my theologian hat, uh, or I, I'm not wearing a theologian hat today, I'm wearing a religious studies hat, and grace is a very theological category, category as, uh, as was already mentioned, uh, with uh, lots of complexities uh, that go along with that. So there, there's another category that circulates in culture uh, that is grace-like, uh, Charisma that I want to think about. Right? Um, 
charisma as the gift of grace, or literally, but uh, also a secularization, in some sense, of a Christian uh, term. But I'll, I'll have more to say about that uh, in a second. So what I want to do is think about how, uh, even if charisma doesn't seem to be uh, a main topic of Chaim's book, it might still be there and might still be uh, playing an important role. And by attending to that charisma, we might both um, see that this attack on supersessionism, and we might also see other interesting things about uh, law um, that, that are worth attending to. Uh, and this brings us back to Jesus, of course, who uh, is um, not only identified with grace as opposed to law, but also a, a figure of charisma, right? One who uh, brings a, a kind of authority that comes from some <coughs> extraordinary gift uh, that is recognized, that uh, has a sort of magnetism. All these sorts of attributes that go with uh, charisma are attributed to, to uh, Jesus uh, as well. Which brings us back, like Professor Levinson, to Max Weber. Uh, while the, the term charisma circulates broadly in uh, discussions of popular culture now, uh, it is uh, Max Weber who uh, had uh, theorization in the realm of uh, social theory of uh, charisma that he was actually uh, drawing from his New Testament uh, theologian colleagues uh, in his uh, university. He was hearing them talking about uh, early Christians and about the way that uh, something grace-like, something extraordinary was circulating in uh, an early Christian community uh, and using charisma to describe that. And so uh, Weber notices that this isn't just in early Christian communities, but this phenomenon of uh, having authority that comes from uh, some sort of perceived extraordinary gift, a kind of personal magnetism, a gift that comes as if it's, uh, as if it's from the beyond, uh, a gift that lends authority. This is something that we find in all sorts of places, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of times, and uh, it's a structure of authority that, to repeat the sort of familiar Weberian story, uh, can be opposed to both traditional authority, the authority of uh, time immemorial, of the elders and their elders and so on, uh, which can give force to norms, or the authority of uh, bureaucratic, uh, legal rational authority. Uh, that comes in a sort of modern bureaucracy. Charisma stands opposed to these three other models in the uh, Weberian <coughs> Rome. And Weber seems to have a, even if he, he is ostensibly neutral, he seems to have a sort of nostalgia for something uh, you know, uh, that can get us out of the, uh, the challenges of modernity. And charisma you know, is circulating in that space. And so there's a sort of temptation uh, to, to think Weber is taking it uh, maybe even too seriously. But the, the, the site at which I think we find charisma most richly, or can reflect on charisma most rich, richly, is in literary texts. Um, because uh, charisma is uh, always already mediated. Right? The trick of charisma is to imagine that it's unmediated, to imagine that the charismatic individual is speaking directly and only to you. But in fact, right, uh, there, are, there is distance, right? there are conventions, there are uh, ways of... Um, uh, uh, habits of thought and language that uh, are always mediating the encounter with a charismatic individual, and, and literature makes that all the, all the clearer. Right? Uh, and we have very rich uh, depictions of uh, charisma in uh, film and in uh, novels, uh, and these, uh, I think of two in particular that have to do with law and charisma, because they open the question of the ambivalence between uh, legal uh, authority and charismatic uh, authority. So mo famously, Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, right? uh, both in its filmic depiction and uh, in the novel, we have a, uh, a lawyer protagonist who, uh, Atticus Finch, is a paradigm of charisma, strong, quiet, uh, commanding the respect of those around him, persuading uh, with just the uh, sort of, uh, almost almost by the force of his personality, always having something about him that, that you can't quite put your finger on, right? Uh, which seems like a kind of um, uh, extraordinary uh, gift that's depicted as a kind of magnetism. Uh, in, the, in the novel, uh, when uh, uh, Atticus Finch is arguing against um, uh, the, the prosecutor in the, the climactic case, whereas the, the prosecutor has the law, books of law on his desk, 
Atticus Finch has a clear desk. Right? There's, it's just him right, standing there. Right? He is authority. He is legal authority, something like legal authority here. There's a mix between the charismatic and the legal, which seems very provocative. Might also think of this uh, fellow uh, named Moses, not in the uh, Hebrew Bible, but in Hollywood, Charlton Heston uh, in the Ten Commandments. Right? Also a great paradigm of American charisma, right? uh, strong, masculine, right? uh, not always with his shirt on, commanding the masses, right? uh, followers, having some extraordinary gifts, speaking to God, getting gifts from God directly, as opposed to the biblical story where there's all sorts of layers of mediation, all sorts of... Um, uh, uh, problems of the tongue that Moses encounters, but in the Hollywood depiction, right, this is uh, uh, law and charisma are identified in this very close uh, sort of way. The opening of uh, Ten Commandments uh, declares, right, this is a story of the birth of freedom, the story of Moses, right? Uh, there was once uh, uh, a kind of law which is bad, right? the Pharaoh's law, Egyptian law, and now there will be a new kind of law straight from God, which is good, right? Moses becomes Jesus, becomes America, right? Uh, are men, uh, and uh, the, the narr- narrative continues asking, are men free souls uh, under God? But under Pharaoh, they're not free. The, the possibility to be free is what uh, the, the Moses promises. So here, the charismatic figure allows for a new law or a new kind of justice to be introduced uh, against a distorted justice of the uh, segregated South and to kill a mockingbird against the Pharaoh's law uh, in the Ten Commandments. Uh, to kill, uh, Ten Commandments, incidentally, was uh, released in 1955 during the Montgomery bus uh, boycott and there are resonances that you can think about there as well uh, with Martin Luther King in particular among, you know, in addition to the conceptual uh, issues. But there's also an ambivalence here, right? An ambivalence that goes along with the uh, sort of worries about cultural supersessionism, about a new law, right, announced by charisma replacing an old law. Uh, along with that, sort of smuggled in by that, are conceptions of masculinity, right, virility, paternal authority, right, nationalism, right, America as represented by the charismatic individual introducing the, the, the new law, uh, And then these texts, uh, both of which I think are ambivalent and rich and open an opportunity if you watch Ten Commandments together with the the book, uh, uh, with with the Hebrew, together with reading the Hebrew Bible, if you watch the film To Kill a Mockingbird together with the novel, right? You see these sort of ambivalences where charisma is on the one hand depicted as this uh, sort of masculine, virile, uh, national thing and in other places complicated, like the the, the layers of mediation Brought, brought to the surface. And yet there's still something <coughs> quasi-charismatic there, right? There's still um, uh, so, something magnetic about the, the protagonist personalities in, in the novel and the uh, Hebrew Bible that, that attract others. Right? So w- w- what I think attending to literary texts like this attunes us to is uh, a way of approaching uh, Chaim's book uh, as one that sees uh, as a book that is exploring the, the, the mixing of uh, charisma and uh, charismatic authority and legal uh, authority. Right? One might think that uh, a text giving an account of halakha would be uh, privileging uh, uh, the uh, authoritative rules or arguments about uh, concepts uh, over authority, authoritative people, right, charismatic individuals. But time and time again in the text, we get special people right, who, who play a, a role uh, in the text. Right? We start with the football stadium. Right? That is a, a, sort of a paradigmatic scene of charisma. Right? The rock star or uh, the, the uh, uh, um, a celebrity uh, or uh, the religious leader filling a stadium. Here it is... Uh, and it's a Talmud it's a halacha itself that is filling the stadium that has some sort of charismatic authority. Right? We get rabbis who are not just generic rabbis, but have uh, proper names, right? that have, uh, we're encouraged by the proper naming to project onto them a, a certain um, uh, specialness, right? a certain otherworldliness uh, that, that gives authority to their decisions, even as it's contested among, among the rabbis. Right? And then we have charisma represented in texts, right? Uh, texts that are uh, about individuals who were imagining to be uh, uh, charismatic, and texts that themselves become uh, charismatic, uh, that have this sort of uh, attraction that comes from beyond. 
uh, layer upon layer of this, we get the, uh, on page 165, Maimonides, right, who uh, is going to take the, this sort of charisma to a whole new level, as Chaim uh, tells us, right, eliminating the proper names of the rabbis, asserting himself in the, in the role uh, of soul uh, authority there, uh, extraordinary authority. And uh, we get the, the complaint uh, of other rabbis that, Mos that Maimonides is setting himself up, quote, like Moses, prophesying from on high. But this, is, uh, this seems like a, a recurrent dynamic throughout the, the, the narrative of halakha, that there are, uh, each, at each moment, there are those who are asserting a kind of charismatic authority mixed in with that uh, assertion of, of law. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, helpfully describes this in a, in a phrase that isn't developed but seems so provocative, right? A, a phrase uh, where, uh, of spiritual capital. So on page 125, uh, Chaim says, uh, the proliferation of halachic material is motivated by the desire to acquire the spiritual and cultural capital that accrues from Torah study. So this seems, this strikes me as precisely what charisma is, spiritual capital mixed with or disguised as uh, cultural capital. And it's contagious, right? When, when one comes in contact with a, sort of a charismatic figure, right? there's a little bit of charisma, a little bit of the glow is left on you and then others around you also see a, a something special uh, about you, and so uh, could it be that uh, you know we could tell the story of halacha as a story of uh, charisma, a spirited tradition where it's a transmission of this sort of charismatic power from on the line. This would complicate the Weberian account that separates sort of traditional modes of authority from charismatic uh, authority that uh, separates the wisdom of uh, uh, the time immemorial from the magnetic personality in the moment because. You know, time immemorial has these mediated, we have access to it through the mediation of charismatic individuals and their representations. And it also complicates the Weberian identification of legal rational and uh, uh, separation of legal rational and charismatic authority because you know, in the seemingly most sort of rote uh, applications of the law, right, uh, in the um, uh, discussions uh, at the yeshiva, for example, right, there's still the teacher, right, the, the, the uh, one who has some special, even if it's uh, in the process of facilitating the discussion, right, there's still something of the personality, something of the human, something of the charismatic, right, the giftedness of the human that, that is powerful there and seems worth attending to. And it's worth attending to not only because uh, it challenges this supersessionist caricature of law and of halakha in particular, uh, which Chaim does in many ways by telling his rich story of law, but it also attunes us to the dangers of charisma. Right? When we see charisma, we have to remember that charisma is morally ambivalent. It's Martin Luther King and also Hitler, right? Gandhi, and also Idi Amin. Right? That they're, that this um, ma magnetism of uh, personality right? can uh, be, uh, conceal and reveal, at the same time can draw people to, to the individual, but can also uh, conceal the... Uh, wisdom of the wealthy and the powerful, the, the ideology that's circulating uh, and is uh, encapsulated in and uh, advanced by the charismatic individual, uh, which we see, I think, uh, even more in the sort of Me Too era of charismatic individuals who we're seeing more and more behind the scenes are doing uh, evil things. So if we're attending to charisma and if we're seeing charisma as an integral part of halakha, can we notice these moments of injustice that could be not too far behind the, the surface of the tradition uh, and uh, grapple with them. So, uh, thank you very much. So like everyone else, and for very good reason, uh, I want to start by thanking the uh, organizers, the conveners of this wonderful conference. I want to thank Chaim, who uh, obviously uh, made this entire thing possible. I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank the Law Review uh, for uh, really, I think, uh, sort of keeping us to our task as far as timing is concerned, and also, I think, eventually, uh, publishing the remarks. Uh, I also want to thank uh, all of the earlier speakers, including uh, the two who have gone so far on this panel, for sort of laying the table, actually, for my entire 
set of remarks. Uh, like Sandy, I actually have changed my title, having listened to uh, the 10 or 12 earlier talks, which were each in its own way just really remarkable. Um, so my title now uh, comes in part from Sandy's having brought in Shylock and uh, from you having brought in Charisma, which I'll get back to, not to mention a lot of earlier other things. I also want to point out that another great thing about this conference, which is unique in my experience, we've had 12, 14 speakers, not a single speaker has used PowerPoint. <laughs> now, this is incredible. I think the odds are like if you're a betting person, a million to one, that you're going to have 12 speakers in 2019, no PowerPoint, but it's wonderful. I teach torts, and I think torts is too complex, actually, uh, to put it down in bullet points so that the audience is just looking at the bullet points and thinking, when is the speaker going to get to the next bullet point, and not doing his or her own thinking about it. But having said that, I decided I would boot the conference up <coughs> into at least the 19th or 20th century by using this chalkboard. So it's really uh, my new title, Binaries Interfusions, <coughs> Binaries Interfusions, or WWJDAS, which stands for What Would Jesus Do About Shylock? <laughs> or more to the point, I guess, of this symposium, Chaim, a question to Chaim, WWSSAS, what would Chaim, Simon, say about, Simon says, what would Simon say about Shylock? Shylock the character is a linchpin character, as you all know, uh, for an understanding in one of our greatest Elizabethan works, one of our greatest works maybe of all time, by Shakespeare that explicitly te tests the relationship of the Jew to the Christian in a secular society. Shylock is a crucial uh, figure, a crucible figure in an understanding of some of the themes that have come out in the conference, including supersessionalism, a word that was not used until your uh, wonderful talk. Uh, the sense of the play is commonly understood is that uh, Shylock, is, as a Jew, is legalistic, pharisaic, blind, impervious to human uh, experience, um, unsusceptible of pity and mercy, uh, and that the Christian characters, through a secular legal <coughs> process, you remember the trial scene, the Christian characters embodied in Portia, who is in disguise, she's not a lawyer, she doesn't really fess up as to uh, her own particular interests. Sandy t said I was very passionate about this. Portia comes in and resolves through a series of magic tricks almost, hermeneutic magic tricks, resolves the many issues in the play against Shylock. And the feeling seems to be it's law versus mercy, that the quality of mercy is not strained. This is something Shylock apparently does not understand. And this is not the way the text is set up at all. Um, I can't believe that a Jew, though there were none in Elizabethan England, did not advise the bard, or possibly even write, maybe from exile, the Merchant of Venice, because there is such a deep understanding of the Jew, and particularly the misunderstood Jew. What would Jesus say about Shylock? And more to the point, what would uh, Chaim in his book, or what has he said? Now you won't find Shylock's name in the index, but I think Chaim very early in the book, and, and I think this has been brought out by some earlier speakers, perhaps uh, Tamara Morsel Eisenberg, but others as well, uh, asked the question, am I right Chaim? Uh, was Jesus right about halakha? And I'm, I am not absolutely sure that the answer one way or another is given by you in the text, which would be halachically appropriate. We want to keep thinking about it. But it certainly leaves a kind of open-ended feeling in the text that is also reflected in certain binaries that you use, although I think this is also very subtle. You speak of halakha uh, on a spectrum uh, often. Uh, between, let's just use the words legalism on the one hand, Torah, 
kind of expansive interpretive literature on the other, right? A spectrum. But all too often, at least in my reading, I found in the text, with many exceptions that I think were excellent, um, more of a binary. That is to say that um, halakha is either legalism or it is Torah, instead of a wide expanse of spectrum. And sometimes in, in the work, it seems as though you are opting for uh, the idea, and I'll just quote from your book, there are times when it seems that the Talmud knows nothing but law, you tell us. And you're talking about the Talmudic treatment of the story of David and Saul, which, as you point out and write beautifully about it, is so human, so three-dimensional, uh, so expansive. But when it comes to Talmudic treatment of that particular story, you say, the Talmud, however, rereads it through a thoroughly halachic lens, ignored or the drama, the emotion, the egoism, and all the juicy details of human life that course through the biblical saga. So this is one of the passages where I think what first looks like a spectrum, at least if you just focused on that, which wouldn't be fair, on that particular quote, becomes a kind of binary, halakha as legalism, which is really ignoring everything that's interesting uh, and expansive about the story that it's commenting on. It's very unfair to, however, uh, peg you uh, or tar you with that particular brush uh, throughout. But I think there are some other binaries that I want to explore briefly, which will uh, I would prefer to see fused into unities, because I think what we have when we're talking about halakha, and other speakers have brought this out, is, yes, heavily entrenched and ensconced in law, and often to the point of what we might almost call nitpicking. And yet, even within the nitpicking, there is a sense that something larger actually is being talked about. And further, that only through what sometimes seems like picayune midrash can we get to the higher element. Instead of, let's say, formulaically saying there's law on the one hand, and then there's spirit or largeness of interest or expansiveness or humanity on the other, I think, having read your whole book, that this is what you really f feel is, no, those are of a piece. They're actually uh, fused, those elements. Um, I'm uh, reminded of what uh, Ed Rock said earlier, and I think this is worth thinking about. Much wisdom is embedded in doctrine, which is a pretty, you know, the first time I, I heard him say that, which was like an hour ago, I said, well, that sort of makes sense. Then I start to think, I don't know, I think I'm going to study that for the rest of my lifetime, <laughs> because I think it's halakha. Much wisdom is embedded in, embedded in doctrine. And I think not all traditions that we've talked about today accept that idea. You know, it's really, it's not a truism. It's something you really have to think about and work on. Doctrine seems to be something that, you know, is so far apart from wisdom. The doctrine may be right or wrong, and as a couple of speakers have brought in, including yourself, we may bring in external elements to test the rightness or wrongness of doctrine. But doctrine is doctrine. It's dry. It's logical. But the idea, I think, in Halakha and Chaim's book definitely brings this out in a variety of places. I'd just like to see it made a little bit more clear. The thing about Halakha is that the two are fused. They're intertwined. And this is extremely difficult for people outside of the tradition of Halakha uh, to grasp, especially in view of what Jesus and Paul were, and I take my earlier colleagues at their word, were reputed to have said about law. I think it's probably wrong as a generalization to say that Paul was an antinomian or that Jesus was opposed to law. That's true. But there's an awful lot in those early sacred texts, and especially in the tradition as it played out, that might lead you to the impression is that there's an inability to understand the beauty of law, the fusing of law within the Jewish tradition at almost every moment into something that is already embedded within it that is higher, that is evoking Torah, that is evoking God. All right, uh, quickly, two points only uh, because they haven't been covered at all, and they're very interesting parts of Chaim's book that also relate to this uh, 
binary versus uh, unity idea. Uh, one has to do with the law of war, which you bring out uh, extremely well, and the binary that I read coming out of this is practicality, pragmatism, let's get real, versus let's stick to halakha, idealism. And your setting towards the end of your book is the law of war in modern day Israel. And uh, the exact um, drush, the exact thing that we're talking about is whether in besieging a city, and in 1982 that city was Beirut, in besieging a city, under Jewish law, you have to leave a side open of the four sides of the city, ruchot, sides. One side under Jewish law has to be left open. And there are a lot of pragmatists in Israel and in the United States. Michael Walzer talks about this in a very famous essay, though I don't read him as really going necessarily against the halakha. But the pragmatists in Israel, like Rab Rabbi Shaul Yisraeli, had a problem with that halakha in the real life world of a modern state. Whereas a hero of mine, and maybe yours, you cite him, Rabbi Shlomo Goren, was saying, yes, when this halakha was written, we didn't have a state. Yes, we're in new, a new era. Others were saying that the most that Jews have to do is to follow the laws of nations even if they went against halakha. But Goran said, no, we have to apply halakha. And people said, well, you're going to siege a city and let everybody leave, uh, which is a simplification, I think, almost of what the halakha from Maimonides, essentially, centuries earlier, was really saying. And then people started to think a little bit about this. And um, if you take the siege of Leningrad, which many of you may be familiar with, really one of the worst sieges of the city during World War II, and it lasted a year and a half or two. If you can picture Leningrad being besieged by the Nazi troops, there was a river, there's a river in Leningrad, and it froze over, and it gave people a chance to escape, and it also gave supplies a chance to come in over the frozen river. Almost a modern day example of what Jews normatively are supposed to do, took place because of nature. It was a terrible siege, but lives were saved in the tens of thousands because of that fourth side. So in Beirut, pragmatists said, no, this is, as, as uh, I love the way Chaim puts this in the book, quoting the more pragmatic, there's a serious pitfall in activating this halakha. It's one of my favorite lines, really. Yeah, so I was reading the halakha. We're besieging Beirut. And by the there were problems under Jewish law about it, the whole idea of making war. That, that background should never be forgotten. You're supposed to announce your intent to your enemies before you go in. You're supposed to make, uh, give them a chance to sue for peace. And then if you go in, you're supposed to leave this fourth side. There's a problem with this halakha. What is the problem? It's not pragmatic. It's not realistic. <coughs> but the binary, pragmatism on the one hand, halakha and idealism on the other, I think needs to be fused. It needs to be uh, reduced into a unity. The two things go together. Halakha is pragmatic, and it can have application. But more importantly, halakha, as I think the, really the, the breadth and depth of Chaim's book teaches us, uh, halakha is also teaching us uh, a way to live at all times, cognizant of not only small issues, but through those, those small issues, uh, large questions. Now, am I giving the, giving the gift of four more minutes? Yeah, yeah, four, more minutes. four more minutes. So I want to cover one other thing in, in respect to uh, the book, but on, the, on this same theme. Uh, you also cover capital punishment, and it's here where uh, someone who is obviously uh, very dear to me and many people in this room, Robert Cover, comes into the picture again in your analysis. To me, Cover uh, is one of those who fuses, he was a charismatic individual, and he fused uh, a sense of, um, well, nomos and narrative, of law, of you could almost say halakha and agada, fused into one in his uh, famous essay and elsewhere in his writing, uh, nomos and narrative. He considered halakha to be not only regulatory, 
uh, but world-creating and paideic. Uh, this is the fusion that I don't always see uh, and would have preferred to see, but it's Chaim's book, and it's wonderful, in his text. What about capital punishment? I love the example that you choose, uh, which namely was uh, the laws of stoning. Uh, and there were intricate kind of, we could say nitpicking laws about what a man should wear, if anything, when he's about to be stoned, compared to what a woman would wear when she's about to be stoned. And it looks like, well, this is a typical missing the forest for the trees going on. But it turns out that uh, what was going on was a deep appreciation of the relationship with what uh, people in this terrible situation uh, were supposed to wear under halachic law and increased suffering for them caused by the clothing uh, that uh, Jewish law uh, asked them. And it was all in a vacuum because there, were, there was no Sanhedrin, there was no capital punishment uh, going on. Cover deals with capital punishment in the same way, and I'll close with this quote. Law's expressive range is profound, and as with other resources of language, the relationship of law's manifest content to its meaning is often complicated, which is a wonderful line. He says, consider the question of using capital punishment to express the dignity of human life and its ultimate worth which I think, again, is an example, whether or not you agree with capital punishment, an example of how rules of law in certain traditions encompass as a unity the higher principles uh, that uh, they are embodying within the legalistic text. Thank you, Chaim. Okay, so I have the impossible um, position of following this amazing day. Um, so I, again, uh, to repeat uh, what everybody said, but earnestly, um, I'm so honored to be a part of this rich conversation, and um, I'm so uh, hum humbled by it. Um, and thank you, Chaim, and thank you to, Villano to Villanova and to our hosts and to our sponsors, um, because this is really an incredible work and an incredible opportunity. Um, so with that, um, I will say that, um, again, it offers an incredibly, uh, Chaim's work offers an, a remarkably accessible and engaging account of the development of the framework of Jewish law. Um, and in doing so, as I think the speakers of the day have demonstrated, um, it refracts the many forces that influence the way that we define the rules. And I use rules in the capacious sense um, to include both rules and standards, um, because I think it will make more sense in the context of my conversation. Um, but the book makes salient the interplay of the contingencies of history, narrative, ideals, culture, power, and text in a way um, that, as you've seen, shed light on other expressions of law. And in reading it, I was struck um, by how it prompts us to consider what we mean by law. Um, and also, this has come, and come up um, in some of our conversations. Um, but in focusing primarily on American texts and the way in which um, the book gives us new purchase on our understanding of American law, um, I hope to look at it from um, in terms of the language um, and narrative that comes through. Um, so specifically, a set of federal district court decisions from the late 1990s about the admissibility of evidence seized in a police stop, so I think serves as a useful case study of the contingencies and norms and the embeddedness of legal texts in the social world, which Chaim's book, um, if not explicitly, I think throughout, um, illuminates and prompts you to think about. Um, so this is not by way of a simple analogy, but by way of demonstrating the ways in which these dynamics can be seen um, at play. Um, so the case I'd like to look at is Bayless versus United, United States, a 1996 case um, that involved a couple of headline making pretrial decisions by then Judge Harold Baer in the Southern District of New York. Um, and in Bayless, Judge Baer considered a motion to suppress evidence that was allegedly obtained in the, in the, in the absence of reasonable suspicion. Um, and the police had stopped, um, the opinion says, the decision says, a middle-aged black woman observed in Washington Heights, New York, 
um, in the very early morning hours, and she was driving a rental car with Michigan license plates. Um, and among other things, they found, um, and among other things, they found 34 uh, kilograms of cocaine and two kilograms of heroin in duffel bags in the car. The among other things, I think there was also $2 million in cash in there. Um, but Judge Baer's opinions, um, which I will return to in a few moments, demonstrate um, the intertextuality of common law decisions um, and the boundary challenge of isolating rule, um, by which I mean rule in the capacious sense, in the rich texts of what we think of as law. Um, so halakha, the rabbinic idea of law, points to the distinctive way that halakha manifests law as lived practices, a belief system, and deep textual engagement of the traditional Jewish canon. Halakha resists easy categorization, which I think is what makes Chaim's book so profound that he makes it look so simple to talk about, um, both as a genre and in terms of its social function. But, as I'd like to argue, this distinctive operation also derives from more universal um, dynamics. Um, it emerges from social, historical, and philosophical for forces and is forged through lived practice and language. Um, and in that way, Halakha points us to a range of factors and influences that, while they may be d expressed in different ways, in distinctive ways, um, make up this uh, more universal process of constituting law. Um, in other words, rather than, or in addition to, categorizing halakha as a strange case of law, um, halakha invites us to consider the constitu constitutive dimensions of what we understand law to mean. Um, and to be fair, um, as others have noted, um, and Chaim's book highlights so beautifully, certain aspects of halakha um, strike some as especially distinctive. So um, the value of learning for learning's sake, the investment in unresolved outcomes, um, at rules that are recognized as unrealizable um, and yet still important, um, they appear especially remarkable. Um, at the same time, more familiarly in line with the conventional structure of Western legal texts, Canonical Jewish texts parse categories, distinctions, and rules which might or might not be literally applicable in the material world. Um, and in the process, they purport to shape human experience. Um, and they have become embedded in social practices that themselves apply and inform their meanings. Um, and the text also operates, as Chaim points out, through a deeply intertextual and elusive structure. Um, and they invite the reader to explore the valences of language, right? They, they don't resist that, they invite it. So Talmudic discussion interweaves expressive and normative dimensions to embrace a multiplicity of meaning. Um, the centrality of dialogue and debate um, situates the text um, in a distinct rhetorical um, and arguably social context. Um, so. Um, for example, the Shulchan Aruch, one text in the canon that's discussed in his book, um, comes to be seen both as an authoritative codification and in uh, Chaim's beautiful um, uh, uh, iteration of it, uh, a devotional text. Um, so by way of synecdochal example, its title demonstrates the range of dimensions through which halachic legal authority is constructed. Translated loosely as the set table, this 16th century code, um, we might identify it as a code, establishes its authority in part by way of illusion. It evokes commentary on the presentation of laws in Exodus, in which Moses is commanded to set out the reasoning of God's law like a table set before the nation. And through the engagement with precedent and performance of authority, and maybe <coughs> think loosely, uh, Mar Marbury here, the Shulchan Aruch creates its place in the canon. Um, yet, its name invites an even more expansive and multidimensional conception of law. A set table presents itself as a metaphor of human existence and socialization, thereby conjuring the, te the text's comprehensive sustenance. It invokes the communal and dynamic facets, along with explicit and implicit rules of fundamental human activity. Um, and as soci sociologists point out, much of our normative experience is determined by the way that we move through or inhabit our world. The so-called habitus, the muscle memory, and the things we all take for granted direct our understanding of the world and the norms we share. Through metaphor of a meal, the set table, gestures towards the unstated components of law that are baked into every community's experience. A two-word word, two word title thereby suggests the interplay among rule-positing texts, practice, and inhabited norms in quotidian life. And if we treat the Shulchan Aruch as indicative, we see that the collection of Jewish texts and the lived traditions that they invite through which they are, and through which they are understood form a distinctive cultural artifact. And at the same time, these dynamics, including expressive, the expressive regulatory interplay that's been talked about 
um, today can be seen as part of a continuum that, while manifested in different ways, influences the way that we understand law, even in the, for some, perhaps more familiar um, space of American life. So in contemporary American life, the formally codified rules of a statute inevitably fail to account for the operation of law. The implementation of a written rule implicates all kinds of human and social dimensions, such as prosecutorial discretion, institutional norms, and bureaucratic processes, to name just a few. And even within the text, the, pro the project of isolating a rule is not necessarily simple. As professors of law, I think Kathy alluded to this earlier today, we teach students to differentiate between holding and dicta, between the majority view and dissenting opinions, for example, but we know these distinctions are not necessarily stable nor independent of social norms. Um, and this came up also, I think Ed reminded us, a litigator constructs and distills rather than finds rules, and line drawing by courts is a function of contingent experiences, context, and framing effect. Which brings us back to the Bayless opinion, the Bayless case that I mentioned at the outset. At the first pretrial hearing in Bayless, Judge Baer granted a motion to suppress the evidence. He held that the police lacked reasonable suspicion to justify the stop. Judge Baer's initial decision follows a familiar mode of legal reasoning, questioning the purported significance of facts in light of context and, at times, overarching principles of justice. Rejecting the state's characterization of events, Judge Baer viewed the facts through a different lens, a move familiar to any lawyer and one that the book highlights as it takes place in the Talmud. Rather than accepting that a car with Michigan plates ought to prompt suspicion in New York, Judge Baer identified its presence as unremarkable especially, as he put it, in a city that considers itself the capital of the world. <laughs> Similarly, Judge Baer rejected the characterization of men seen approaching the car, quote, single file, um, as suspicious. He rejected that. And, he's, and he rejected the characterization of their running off at the sight of an unmarked police car as evasive conduct. Shifting the contextual frame, the decision asserts that in light of recent successful prosecution of police corruption in this very neighborhood, and these are Judge Bear's words, had the men not run when the cops began to stare at them, it would have been unusual. <laughs> More unusually, perhaps, Judge Bear's first pretrial decision seizes on intertextuality to explicitly telegraph its philosophical perspective. It begins with an epigraph that quotes John F. Kennedy stating, the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, pervasive, and realistic. The opinion thereby reminds us that the articulation and enactment of law is not only informed by worldviews and at times aspirational ideals, but is also impacted by contingent social forces. And in fact, Judge Bear's first bailiff's decision quickly became a cultural flashpoint in what happened to be a year of tough on crime campaigning. The case prompted an outcry from the press, New York Times editorial page included, and politicians ranging from then Republican uh, New York City Mayor Giuliani to President Bill Clinton, with some even calling for Judge Baer's impeachment. Following this response, Judge Baer granted a motion for reconsideration and re-argument, which in turn opened the door for additional testimony by the police about the transaction history on the particular corner on which the car was spotted. And in addition to highlighting the way laws embedded in social forces and the distinct places and moments, and, and, it, and the way it's embedded in moments and places in time, uh, excuse me, place, distinct places and moments in time, the second phase of this case illustrates the difficulty of delineating legal rules in a rich text. The second Bayless decision reflects Judge Baer's concerted effort to circumscribe the rules and authority of law. But reminiscent of, if not analogous to, the challenge of defining agada, this decision too demonstrates the difficulty of isolating law in the richness of text. The second, in the second Bayless decision, Judge Baer reversed course and admitted the evidence, explicitly abandoning what he called the dicta in his initial decision. And in doing so, he acknowledged the porousness of the decision, of the distinction between reasonable suspicion and an unlawful stop in light of the complexity of facts. The facts of this case, he says, have consistently danced the fine line between a valid search and seizure and a trespass on citizens' rights. But the expression of his disavowal performs its ambivalence. It demonstrates the impossibility of neatly extracting law from language or social existence. He veers back to the macro socio legal problem that the case engages and asserts, while it is clear that the Fourth Amendment operates to protect all members of our society from unreasonable searches and seizures, it is equally as unclear whether this protection exists to the fullest extent for people of color generally and in inner city neighborhoods in particular. 
And notwithstanding the pains he takes to define the holding as a proposition of law, the decision continues to belie the simplicity of this definition. Alluding to aspirational narratives and social critique, Judge Baer concludes by quoting Justice Thurgood Marshall's rejection of stereotypes as a basis for reasonable suspicion in dissenting opinion in, in, the, US, in, the, in the case of U.S. versus Sokolow. In what could be considered dicta, Judge Baer reiterates Justice Marshall's warning. Because the strongest advocates of Fourth Amendment rights are frequently criminals, it is easy to forget that our interpretations apply to the innocent and guilty alike. Considered across time, the challenge of circumscribing the law invoked in this case becomes even more pronounced. We can see the shifting interplay of narratives, culture, ideals, power um, in, light, in, this, in these texts in light of recent case law through which these, this aspirational narrative that Judge Baer offers migrates from dicta to dissent to operative rules. In 2016, in the case of Utah versus Strife, Justice Sonia Sotomayor penned a headline-grabbing dissent. And in Strife, Sotomayor rejected the Supreme Court's holding that the discovery of a pre-existing traffic warrant attenuated the connection between an unlawful, admittedly suspicionless police stop and the seizure of drugs. And in light of the existence of a warrant discovered after the stop, the majority of the court held the evidence of the drug crime was admissible. Her dissent, Sotomayor's dissent to this holding, echoes Martin Luther King Jr.'s now canonical letter from a Birmingham jail to give way to the overlooked social costs of unlawfully obtained evidence. She tells a story that positions the reader as an innocent defendant, and not only cites literature, from James Baldwin to ta Coates, but creates a space for the legitimacy of empathetic texts as a basis for judgment. In Strife, Justice Sotomayor mobilizes King's rhetorical approaches and reframes the narrative to reject the majority's cost-benefit analysis assessment of, of the exclusionary rule in this case. Echoing King's demand for empathy through direct address, her dissenting opinion begins by warning the reader, do not be soothed by the opinion's technical language. This case allows the police to stop you on the street, demand your identification, and check it for outstanding traffic warrants, even if you are doing nothing wrong. She warns, by legitimizing the conduct that produces this double consciousness, the case tells everyone, white and black, guilty and innocent, that your body is subject to invasion while courts excuse the violation of your rights. The opinion thereby embeds literary illusion and contingent social experience into its definition of the costs that must be weighed in the application of the exclusionary rule. And, though expressed in dissent, this vision ultimately emerges as a rule in other cases that begin to recognize the experience of others. For example, the same <coughs> year, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court determined that the flight of black men from the police must be considered in the context of racial profiling when assessing the reasonable suspicion, thereby creating a diachronic link to bearers uh, to bear's pressure and flame law. Is that two or zero? Five. Wow. Okay. I will, I will make it in time. I will wrap up. That was perfect. I will wrap up by noting that this complex interaction of texts, norms, rules, contingent contexts, formative narratives, and the application to the force of law is not confined to our public space. Indeed, in an area that is uh, closer to home for me, um, the distinctive American treatment of contracts, especially the proliferation of contracts of adhesion in the form of consumer contracts, non-disclosure agreements, and terms of use, for example, can be seen as an outgrowth of a particular area uh, idea, excuse me, a particular idea of contract in the 19th century as a counterpoint to slavery. Following emancipation, transactions between formerly enslaved people replicated the constraints of slavery and were deemed vol voluntary. And in this way, contracts served as a mark of freedom and shaped our understanding of what freedom means. And as a result of this American, of an American worldview of contract as a manifestation of freedom, we have perhaps come to take for granted that our legal rights do not presuppose a social safety net, education, or healthcare as they might do in other parts of the world. And similarly, our contract, our contract doctrine cannot be unpacked from this worldview, as we stand in contrast to other legal systems that recognize the asymmetrical power dynamic of certain form contracts. In a world of seduction by contract, American consumers are given the so-called choice of not transacting or agreeing to ancillary terms that threaten to deprive them of fundamental rights. In other words, contemporary American contract law is also hard to unpack from the history language, and culture that give it meaning. Of course, history, text, social experience, culture, rules, and power each operate differently. But as Chaim Saman's lucid and amazing book reminds us, we should not overlook the contingent and defining dynamics of how they con come to constitute law.
So, in what can only be called a law review symposium miracle, we actually have time for a few questions before Haim, who is waiting in the green room, comes up for his final performance. <laughs> so, do we have any questions for the panelists at this point? Anybody concerned about anything? Anybody want to ask a question? Is everybody anxious to hear Haim's uh, response? Good. Well, let's bring Haim up then for the last part of the program. <laughs> Tim will come up after you. Wow. Um, so here's what I'm not going to do, which is uh, go panel by panel and paper by paper and offer remarks. Uh, maybe we'll do that in writing. I feel like uh, there's some Yiddish proverb that needs to uh, come up here, and I thought of one, that it's like, uh, the brain cannot absorb what the tuchus cannot handle. <laughs> Which means that at this point, everyone's tired and fidgety, so this isn't a, uh, a, a place for, for a long discussion. Uh, the book of Genesis tells us of a dramatic <clears throat> moment when Jacob is about to confront his brother, Esau, or Esau. My brother is here. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Um, so Jacob knows uh, that he's about to meet Esau, but he doesn't know whether his brother comes in peace or in arms. Uh, that's not so different from inviting really, really smart scholars to review your book. <laughs> but in the end, uh, we learn that Esau comes in peace, uh, and so did you all. Uh, but more serious, in the prelude to this meeting, Jacob says something that has been resonating with me today. I'll read it in Hebrew and then in uh, the NIV translation. Katonti mikola chasadim mikola emet asher asita tavdecha ki vimakli avarti ter edena ze vata iti lishnei machanot. In the standard translation, Jacob says, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown me because I have come with only my staff when I cross this river, but I now have become two camps. And this is certainly how I feel today. But in Hebrew, the word the NIV translates as unworthy shades slightly different. Katonti, I am too small for it. And Jacob expresses how small he feels in light of all that's been done for him. And it's that very sense of smallness that I felt throughout the day, despite being called Shylock, Mendelssohn, Spinoza, <laughs> and other wonderful things. But like Jacob, I felt that when I started on this journey, I had little more than a staff embarking on a path that wasn't really well defined in the literature and trying to figure out how to write about what I wanted to uh, in a way that made sense to a number of different uh, groups of people. Now, in the aforementioned verse, Jacob describes his journey as ending in two camps. In the simplest reading of the text, it means that he is now so much you know, family and children and people and property that he could divide them literally into two camps. But the rabbis never shied away from a good midrash, and in that <coughs> tradition I'll do the same. Uh, the Kabbalists explain that the world progresses through oscillating waves of unities and disunities, maybe picking on Richard's uh, last point. Every age has them, but we live in a time of great disunity between what we might call the religious and the secular or between law and religion, at least in the law school context. And of course I understand it, and not naive about its causes, um, but I wasn't really raised to believe this way, nor do I fundamentally see the world this way. Uh, my hope for this book was that for it to be received as scholarship on the one hand and as Torah on the other. Scholarship is the work of the law school, the university, the intellectual community that we're, we have here and that we're familiar with. Torah is something different. It's produced by a community of those who live and love Torah and operate under its norms. Now, in many ways, the world of scholarship and Torah can be similar. Both require text, a study and dedication to sources, precision, exactness, and balance with creativity. And yet, in many ways, they're different. The ideal type of scholarship that we've certainly inherited from the German universities is dispassionate, distant, and always aware of its bias. The ideal Torah is opposite. It's passionate, invested, immersed, and biased towards the Torah itself. And these are my two camps. As I sit, and I think many believers in the modern world do, both within these two camps, 
and sometimes because we're between them, outside of them both. And at the deepest level, the challenge was to be able to build a bridge between these competing ontologies to create something that might be seen as scholarship by the first-rate academics we've brought here, as well as Torah by yeshiva deans and people invested in that community. And this has been one of the most gratifying uh, aspects of this conference is as we built the days that we kept on bouncing between these and starting, you know, almost autobiographically in the kind of internal form of Torah and then expanding outwards towards, you know, other religions and other aspects of the legal academy. So I don't flatter myself to think that I've achieved any goal, but maybe if we've just taken one small step towards bridging these worlds, I think the whole thing has been worth it. So with that, I'd like to thank the Law Review, of course, the administration of Villanova, all of you came out here, the staff, Nicole, Patty, and everyone for making this possible. Thank you, and Shabbat Shalom. On behalf of the entire Villanova Law Review, I'd like to thank all of you for particip participating in our annual Norman J. Sh Norman J. Shikoy Symposium. We'd first like to thank the Shikoy family for their continued generosity and support to make this possible year in and year out. I'd like to think that a conference that has brought together such a talented and esteemed group of panelists, faculty, judges, and students is exactly what Mr. Shikoy had envisioned at, when he was editor-in-chief here at Villanova. So I'd like to thank each of our amazing panelists for the, taking the time to travel with us and speak with us and really do their part in making Mr. Shakoy's vision become a reality. Additionally, each student that had the privilege of being here today will walk out of this building a better academic than they were when they came this morning. I would also like to thank our own faculty for their never-ending support of all the Law Review's endeavors, especially this symposium. We are incredibly fortunate to attend an institution with a faculty and administration that provides such immense encouragement and support to its students. I specifically would like to thank Father Peter, Father Peter, and Dean Alexander for their remarks earlier today, as well as our moderators, Professors Caudill, Dempsey, Mark, and Moreland. And of course, the man of the hour, Professor Saman. Professor Saman's book led us to an incredibly rich conversation that allowed the Law Review to succeed in its goal of bringing faculty members, administrators, and students together as a single academic community to reflect on the implications of law and what it, ha what it has to say about life itself. It was our honor to host not only a celebration of the existing scholarship, but also look forward to the forthcoming scholarship that will undoubtedly flow from today's discussion. Last and certainly not least, I'd like to thank our amazing staff on the Villanova Law Review, without whom, quite literally, none of this would be possible. It is a great honor to lead a flagship journal with such a talented, intelligent, and dedicated staff through and through. I will never be able to thank them enough for being exactly the people, students, and academic leaders that they are today. So thank you all. And with that, I'll add a th final thank you to all of you who came and closed today's symposium. Thank you all, and have a safe travel home. Thank you.